Welcome, my dear students and other passers-by, to this, my first lecture in Chapter 7's coverage of periodic properties of the elements, also known in some circles as periodic trends. In this video, I'm going to talk to you about the history of the periodic table and effective nuclear charge, also known as Z-effective. Now, after this video and a couple of videos that will follow, and I'll have links in the description below or at the end of the video or floating over my head somewhere, you will gain the following skills. First, an appreciation of the history of the periodic table. Second, the ability to describe and calculate the effective nuclear charge, also known as the effective or sometimes abbreviated as ZEF. And last, you will know periodic table trends in atom sizes and ions sizes and be able to use them to sort through a bunch of examples. We'll begin then with the history of the periodic table. So taken directly from our text, which is referenced in the description below, quote, the discovery of chemical elements has been ongoing since ancient times. Certain elements such as gold appear in nature in elemental form and were thus discovered thousands of years ago. In contrast, some elements such as technetium are radioactive and are radioactive and intrinsically unstable. We know about them only because technology developed during the 20th century to make those discoveries. Now, most elements readily form compounds and consequently are not found in nature in their elemental form. For centuries, therefore, scientists were unaware of their existence. During the early 19th century, advances in chemistry made it easier to isolate elements from their compounds. As a result, the number of known elements more than doubled from 31 in the year 1800 to 63 by the year 1865. Now, as the number of known elements increased, scientists began classifying them. In 1869, Dmitry Mendeleev in Russia and Lothar Meyer in Germany published nearly identical classification schemes. Both scientists noted that similar chemical and physical properties recur periodically when the elements are arranged in order of increasing atomic weight. Scientists at that time had no knowledge of atomic numbers. Atomic weights, however, generally increase with increasing atomic numbers. So both Mendeleev and Meyer fortuitously arranged the elements in proper sequence. Now, although Mendeleev and Meyer came to essentially the same conclusion about the periodicity of elemental properties, Mendeleev is given credit for his ideas more vigorously and stimulating new work. For example, both gallium and germanium were unknown to Mendeleev, but he boldly predicted their existence and properties, referring them as eka aluminum, that is under aluminum, and eka silicon, that is under silicon. And that makes sense because gallium and germanium, these two elements here, would be the elements that would appear on the periodic table under aluminum and under silicon respectively. So when these elements were eventually discovered, their properties closely matched those that were predicted by Mendeleev. In 1913, two years after Rutherford proposed the nuclear model of the atom, English physicist Henry Moseley developed the concept of atomic numbers. Bombarding different elements with high energy electrons, Mersley found that each element produced X-rays of a unique frequency and that the frequency generally increased as the atomic mass increased. Mersley arranged the X-ray frequencies in order by assigning a unique whole number called an atomic number to each element. Mersley correctly identified the atomic number and the number of protons in the nucleus of the atom. Now the concept of atomic number clarified some problems in the periodic table of Mersley's day, which was based on atomic weights. For example, the atomic weight of argon over here, which is atomic number 18, is greater than that of potassium way over here, which has atomic number 19. Yet the chemical and physical properties of argon are much more like neon and krypton than like those of sodium and rubidium. However, when the elements are arranged in order of increasing atomic number rather than increasing atomic weight, argon and potassium appear in their correct places as shown right here in the table. Mersley's studies also made it possible to identify holes, that is vacancies, in the periodic table which led to the discovery of previously unknown elements as those vacancies were filled in. So that is our text's Brief recap of the periodic table, which allows us to segue now into Z effective. So each electron in an atom simultaneously feels attraction to the protons in the nucleus and repulsion by the other electrons in the atom. For example, the outermost electron, the one right here in this make-believe atom right here, feels attracted to the protons in the nucleus, but also repulsed 
by the other electrons in inner shells that are between it and the nucleus. We say then that the in-between electrons, these one in lower energy levels or orbitals, shield the outermost electron from its attraction to the protons in the nucleus. This makes it so that the outermost electron does not feel the protons in the nucleus as strongly as it otherwise would. Now, obviously, inner electrons, that is, ones that are closer to the protons in the nucleus, will feel the pull from those nuclear protons more strongly than outer shell electrons. The strength of the attraction between an electron and the protons in its atom's nucleus is called its effective nuclear charge, or Z-effective, sometimes abbreviated as ZEF. Now, Z-effective can be calculated mathematically as follows, where the letter Z here is the number of protons in the nucleus, which is equal to that element's atomic number, the box in which it appears on the periodic table. And S is something called the screening constant. So what in the world is S? Well, S happens to be equal to the number of electrons found in lower level orbitals. That is, orbitals that are lower in energy and hence are between whichever electron you're calculating Zef for and the nucleus. For example, let's pretend this fictional atom has three protons right here. Now, if that were the case, then the ZEF experienced by the outermost electron would be equal to Z minus S. Now, Z is the number of protons, which for this fictional example, I've set at three. But what is S? S is the total number of all electrons that are between the nucleus and the outermost electron, whose Z effective we're happening to calculate here. How many total electrons are there in lower energy levels between this outermost electron here and the protons in the nucleus? Yeah, in this case, there are two, these two. So S would be equal to two. Thus, the Z effective experienced by this outermost electron would be three, the number of protons, minus two, the number of shielding electrons, which comes to positive one. Make sense? Good. Let's take a look at another example. What if I wanted to calculate the Z effective for the outermost, in other words, the valence electrons for fluorine? Well, what I do? Well, what I would do is follow these steps. I first of all determine the number of protons in fluorine's nucleus, which happens to be equal to its atomic number, the box in which it appears on the periodic table, which happens to be nine. This number nine is Z. Next, I determine the complete electron configuration of fluorine as we discussed back in chapter six, for which I've got a link in the description below or floating over my head. Now that electron configuration for fluorine is this one right here. Next, I decide which orbitals are the valence orbitals. Now, which of all of these orbitals, the 1s, the 2s, or the 2p, are the valence or outermost orbitals? Well, the valence or outermost orbitals are the ones that have the highest n or principal quantum number. In the case of fluorine, the valence orbitals here are the 2s and the 2p. These two orbitals and all of the electrons in them are the valence outermost orbitals. Next, I decide which orbitals are lower in energy than the valence orbitals. Now for fluorine, there's only one lower energy orbital. It's the 1s orbital. So all of the electrons here in 2s and 2p, those are all valence electrons. And the lower electrons are the electrons down here in this 1s orbital. Those are the ones that would be in between the 2s and 2p outermost electrons or valence electrons and the nucleus. Next, I would count how many total electrons there are in that lower energy orbital. Now for fluorine, this is two. It's this number two right here. So we know that there are two electrons in the 1s orbital because it's indicated in the 1s2 part, that little two superscript there. That's the number of electrons in that 1s orbital. That number of electrons, two, is the S value in the formula for Z effective. Then we just calculate it out. Z effective for the valence electrons in fluorine then is gonna be equal to Z minus S, which is nine, fluorine's number of protons, minus two, the number of electrons that are at a lower orbital energy level, the 1S2 right here. You can see nine minus two is plus seven, which is the Z effective experienced by the outermost electrons in fluorine. Now, here are some more Z effective details. Turns out we can also calculate Z effective for inner shell electrons. When doing this, the steps are exactly the same. Z is equal to that element's number of protons, that is its atomic number, and S is equal to the total number of electrons that are in lower energy orbitals than the energy level for the electrons that you're calculating for. Additionally, when calculating S, that shielding constant, the electrons that happen to be in the same energy level as whichever electron you're calculating for do not count. They're all given a value of zero. So we're only counting the electrons that are in lower energy levels. Furthermore, the larger the Z effective, the more strongly an electron feels attracted to the protons in the nucleus. Good, good. Let's go to some problems. This one right here. What value do you estimate the Z effective experienced by the outermost electron in sodium and potassium, assuming blah, 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 blah. And next, which will experience the greater effective nuclear charge or Z effective, the electrons in an N equals three shell of argon or in the same energy level for krypton? Now, if you're interested in seeing the answers to these questions, I invite you to click the video floating over my head or in the description below, in which I will work them out for you.
Until next time, please have an enjoyable rest of your day.